Today's scripture is from Exodus chapter 12, verses 33 to 42. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. You may be seated. As we get started, let me pray for us. Faithful God, how great is your love and how powerful is your word. And so I pray now as we come under your word, we and the kids downstairs, that you would be with us and stir in our hearts a sense of your majesty that we may glorify you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Sam. I'm on the team here, and we are in our series on Exodus. Five years ago, my family and I moved to Vancouver from Singapore. Our family of four packed our lives into suitcases and traveled halfway across the world. And if you ask me what I remember of the time, I remember how hectic it was. There was so much to do, so much to pack, and so many goodbyes to say. And in the midst of all that hurry and and all that we had to do, it felt like we didn't have time. We didn't have time to, to grasp or even understand the significance of what was happening. Even though it was significant, we were leaving the place that we called home, and we were stepping out into the unknown of Vancouver, not knowing anyone other than the fact that we were sure that it was where God was graciously calling us to. It was a significant moment, but all we could think of was the next thing on our to-do list. If you've ever been through a big life change, moving house, moving city, perhaps even moving country, you can probably relate to this, can't you? Being so busy and having such a long to-do list that you don't have the hit space or the time to grasp the significance of what's happening to you. And and that's a bit of what's going on in our passage today. The Israelites are in a hurry. Pharaoh has finally agreed to let them go, and they have just a few hours to, to pack up their lives and leave for good. After hundreds of years of waiting, now they don't have enough time. There's so much to do and so little time. They don't even have time to leaven their dough or prepare provisions for the journey. They're packing up everything. They're gathering their family and their livestock and their possessions. They're one last sweep of the house. Make sure you didn't leave anything behind. Make sure you check under the bed. Didn't leave any chicken in the corner of the barn. Okay, now we've got everything. You sure you got everything? Now let's rush to go and meet everyone in the meeting point. We need to hurry. We don't want to be the ones who everyone else is waiting for. We don't want to be that family. Okay, now everyone is here. Now we're, now we're moving. But then God says, stop. God says, stop everything you're doing. Amidst all the hurry and the busyness, God says, stop. Take a breath. Now another one, take time to understand 
and remember the significance of what is happening right now. Because God is doing something very significant. He's saving them from slavery after all those years, after all those suffering, after all those cries that seem to be going out into the void, God is finally answering their cries. God is saving them from slavery. And so God says, stop, take, just stop for a moment. Stop your hurry. And then God gives them the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, two rituals they were to do that year and then every year so that they would understand what God was doing for them and so that they would remember what God was doing for them. And those are our two points for today. Understanding God's salvation and remembering God's salvation. Understanding and remembering. So to our first point, understanding God's salvation. The, the passage that was just read captures the moment the Israelites were leaving Egypt, and there are some things about God's salvation that we need to make sure that we understand before we go any further. Look at verse 33. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. And I've bolded a few words um, because there's a subtle wordplay going on here that we, we don't want to miss. The words that are translated here as send them out are actually the same words that God has been uttering all this time when he told Pharaoh to let his people go. And the word translated as urgent is actually also one of the words used to describe Pharaoh's hard and resolute heart in the earlier chapters. So our English translation has, has translated these words to, to smooth, it, smooth it out so it reads better. But, but a more wooden translation that one of the commentators gives is like this. The Egyptians were resolute concerning the people to hurry, to let them go out of the land in haste. They were resolute it concerning the people to hurry, to let them go out of the land in haste. Now, it doesn't sound as good, does it? <laughs> it doesn't flow as well, but I want us to see this because it shows the wordplay that is going on, and it's important we see the wordplay because the wordplay is saying something about God's purposes. Even as Pharaoh has been, and even as Pharaoh's heart has been resolute in not letting the people go, nothing and no one can frustrate God's purposes. And so eventually, the Egyptians are resolute in letting the people go. Nothing and no one can frustrate God's purposes. We just celebrated Good Friday and Easter. They reminded that not even sin, not even death, can frustrate God's good purposes for salvation for the world. Ephesians 1 verse 9. Ephesians 1 verse 9. We read about how making known to us the mystery of God's will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as what? As a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Whatever God plans and purposes to do, nothing and no one can stand in His way. In Christ's city, do we believe that? Do we believe that? Because it's both an assurance and a warning, isn't it? For some of us, we need that assurance, don't we? The assurance that nothing and no one can frustrate God's good purposes. Even when the way seems dark, even when the obstacles loom large, even when we have no idea how God can make something good out of the mess, this is an assurance that God's good purposes will prevail. They always have and they always will. But for some of us, it's not really the assurance we need, is it? It's, it's the warning Perhaps some of us are like Pharaoh. We're living in opposition to God's good purposes. Perhaps we're even trying to run away from God's good purposes. And so for some of us, we need this warning, don't we? Nothing and no one can frustrate God's good purposes. But in God's salvation, we don't just see God's good purposes. We also see God's lavish generosity, 1235. 
that the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Christ said, Behold God's generosity. In saving the, the Israelites, he gave them the riches of freedom, the freedom from slavery and the freedom to belong to him. But that's not all he does. He also gave them silver and gold jewelry and clothing, just as he promised in 321. God wasn't just generous with the Israelites, he was lavishly generous with the Israelites, far more generous than he needed to be and they could ever imagine. And God continues to be lavishly generous with us today. Ephesians 1, 7. Ephesians 1, 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Christ said, just like with the Israelites, God continues to be lavishly generous with us today. But here's the thing. We'll see later on in Exodus that Israelites use God's generosity for one of two things. They use God's generosity to build the tabernacle that God instructs them to build, but they also use God's generosity to build a golden calf that God has instructed them not to build. One to worship God, one to worship a false God, Christ City, how are we using God's generosity to us? Are we using God's provision to worship God or to worship ourselves? Are we using God's generosity to to follow God's instructions or our own desires? The freedom we have in Christ, are we using it to serve God? or to worship false gods, to build God's kingdom or our own kingdom. But there's also one more thing we need to notice, we need to understand about God's salvation, and it's in 12 verse 42. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. If it's not already been made clear in the first 11 chapters, 1242 makes it abundantly clear, doubly clear, absolutely clear. Israel's salvation, it's all of God's work. Israel's salvation is all of God's work. It was a night of watching by who? By the Lord. The Israelites didn't earn their salvation, they received God's salvation. It was only because God watched over them that they could be freed from slavery. And you know what? It's still the same with us today. Our salvation is still all of God's work. Ephesians 2 verse 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what? We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which who who prepared them beforehand? God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See the repetition in this In this passage, our salvation is by grace. It is the gift of God, not the result of our own works. We are His workmanship. By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have been rescued from death and rescued from slavery. The day we stop being grateful for our salvation, the day we stop being thankful for God's grace is the day that we have forgotten that salvation is all of God's grace and all of God's work. Christ City, are we thankful? Christ City, are we grateful? Do we remember that our salvation is all of God's work? On our best days, do we remember that there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation? And on our worst days, do we remember that there is nothing we can do to lose our salvation. It is all of God's grace. It is all of God's work. When you look for assurance of your salvation, when Satan tempts you to despair, don't look within, look outside of yourself at Christ. 
When you are wondering, am I really saved? Don't look at yourself. Look at Christ on the cross. Because it's not by our work, it's by His work that we are saved. The assurance comes not from ourselves, it comes from Him. But even as we understand God's salvation, we are called to remember God's salvation, which is our second point, remembering God's salvation. Even as God was in the midst of saving His people, He was putting up signposts and giving them instructions all along the way so that they would remember the salvation they had in Him. The point of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was to remember God's salvation, 12, 14. This day shall be a shall be for you a memorial day. 13 verse 3, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out of this place. And then 6 verses on, 13 verse 9, And it shall be to you as a sign on your head, hand and as a memorial between your eyes. Remember, remember, remember. The point here is to remember. Remembering the God who remembered them in their suffering and remembering the God who brought them out of the place of their suffering. What we tell ourselves matter, doesn't it? What we tell ourselves matter matters and what we tell ourselves depends on what we remember, doesn't it? Our identity as God's people is based on remembering, remembering what God has done for us and who He has saved us to be. So even when we're in a hurry, actually especially when we're in a hurry, when the to-do list gets longer and longer, God instructs us to remember and to take time to remember. And our passage gives us three things about God's salvation that we need to remember. The first is this, remember the details. Remember the details. Every year, God's people were to celebrate the Passover. They were to kill an unblemished year-old lamb at twilight, roast it on the fire, and eat it at night with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The Passover remembered the Passover lamb who was sacrificed in place of their firstborns. And then every year, they were to hold the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. And unleavened just means without yeast. So unleavened bread is, is, is bread without yeast. Every year after the Passover, they were to eat unleavened bread for seven days and make sure that leaven was not even in their houses. And what was the point of this? So there's a cafe along Fraser Street called Batard. I don't know if you're familiar? Some of you? Uh, there's a cafe called Batar. That was one of the first meals that our family had when we first came to Vancouver. And I, and I bring this up because now every time we eat there, we're transported back to those first moments. It, it, the taste and the smell, it brings us back to those first moments that we were in Vancouver. And, because that's what food does, doesn't it? Food can transport us back to particular moments, particular memories, and that's what the Feast of Unleavened Bread was all about. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was to transport the Israelites back to that first moment, that moment of salvation. The memory of leaving Egypt when they were in such a hurry, they didn't even have time to put leaven in their bread, and so they associated the taste of the unleavened bread with the feeling of freedom. They weren't just eating bread, they were eating God's goodness. They weren't just tasting the lack of leaven, they were tasting God's freedom. But we see in the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, it wasn't just about remembering, was it? It was about remembering the right details because the details matter. God didn't just say, remember. He gave them instructions on how to remember, detailed instructions. It wasn't a Passover chicken. It wasn't a Passover fish. It wasn't Passover tofu. It was Passover lamb. And it had to be cooked a specific way and eaten a specific way on a specific day, at a specific time of day. <laughs> 
It wasn't enough for them to eat unleavened bread for one day, they had to eat it for seven days, long enough to drill it into their consciousness. And the point is this, the details matter. We don't get to decide the details, God decides the details. We don't get to decide how God saves us, God decides how God saves us. We don't get to decide what God should do. Our job is to remember what God has done. The Christian life is not based on feeling, it's based on fact. It's not based on what I want to do, it's based on what God has saved us to do. Our job is to remember what God has done and to have a rhythm of remembering what God has done and who God has saved us to be. That's why every year we celebrate Christmas and Good Friday and Easter. During the preaching meeting every year, we talk about how the struggle, the tension of wanting to be original, but then realizing there's nothing original to say. (laughs) We know what happened. Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter, Jesus was born, he died, and he came back from the dead. But that's the point. We're not meant to be original. And if we are, you should tell us. (laughs) Because the point is not to make up something new, it's to remember what has been done, what God has done. Every week, we gather together as God's people for worship, word, and sacrament. We sing together, we pray together, we sit under God's Word together, and we celebrate communion together. What are we doing? We are remembering and we are responding. Communion is the new Passover meal that Jesus gave us. When He gave us the the communion, He gave it to us during the Passover. We see this in Matthew 26. Jesus gave us the Passover... He gave us the communion as the new Passover to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us, to remember that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Every year, every week, and actually every day, every day we are to read and meditate and respond to God's word by His Spirit. Christ City, do we have rhythms of remembering? Christ City, do we have rhythms of remembering? Not just in the year, not just in the week, but every day. Do we have rhythms to remember what God has done, what God says He will do, what God is doing, and who God has saved us to be? Christ City, do we have a rhythm of remembering? Because the opposite of remembering is forgetting. If we are not intentional in remembering, we are forgetting. If you're not familiar with essential Christian beliefs, or if you need a refresher, our essentials course, we we started it because we wanted to give uh, a space for people to learn and to, what's the word, remember. We've also, um, after, after this sermon, we've pinned an article on our website with some great book recommendations on, what, on essentials of the Christian faith. And you can take a look at our website. So, we remember the details of God's salvation, but we also are to remember our distinction as God's people. Keeping God's commandments didn't save someone. It was a response to already being saved. Note, note the, the order. The order is really important here. God gives commandments only after He has saved His people. God has already saved them, and so He is calling them to do those things in response to salvation, not in order to earn salvation. God makes clear that only those who have been saved, only those who are part of His people, are to follow His commands. We see that in, in each of the instructions for the feasts and, and uh, for all the different feasts. There was a distinction between those who were God's people and those who were not. Between those who were saved and those who were not saved. Between those who were in and those who were out. We see this distinction in the instructions on who could eat the Passover. Look at 12 verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover, no foreigner shall eat of it. 
But every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. The idea of foreigner and hired worker in verse 45, it's describing those who are just passing through. They're they're not to eat the Passover because they're not part of God's people. They're only temporarily part of, uh, among God's people. It's like the difference between those who are in Canada because they are citizens and those who are on a visitor pass. One group is part of the people. One group is just temporarily passing through. And we don't just see the distinction in who could eat the Passover, we, could, we also see the distinction in how they were to eat the Passover. Verse 46. Verse 46 of chapter 12. It shall be eaten in one house, you shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. These are not random instructions. These instructions that none of the meat should be taken outside of the house, that none of the bones are broken, they are are intentional. They are part of ensuring that none of the meal could be shared with those who are not part of God's people. You can't take any of the meat outside of the house. When there are leftovers, you can't just get a takeaway bag to go. You can't even break any of the bones. The lamb is only for those of God's people around that table. It's only, those for the, it's only for those on the inside, not for those on the outside. The distinction is made clear in the, in the, in the eating. But even if you talk about distinction, being part of God's people wasn't based on ethnicity. It was based on faith. We see a hint of this in verse 38. Verse 38 talks about a mixture of Israelites and non-Israelites going up out of Egypt together. Verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them. Maybe some of you caught that when the the scripture was being read. It wasn't just the Israelites who were leaving. A mixed multitude also went up with them. Being part of God's people wasn't by ethnicity, it was by faith in a God who saves. You see it again in verse 48. Anyone who puts their faith in the Lord as reflected by circumcision, they are part of God's people and so they are to partake in the Passover too. Verse 48, if a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. Circumcision in this time was a reflection of faith. Only those who have put their faith in God are part of God's people. Everyone's invited to be part of God's people, but only those who have put their faith in God are part of God's people, which is why there needs to be a clear distinction between who is in and who is out. The distinction isn't isn't about pushing people away, it's about inviting people in. We can only invite people in when there is a clear distinction between who is out and who is in. Christ City, there is no invitation without distinction. There is no invitation without distinction. And the most unloving thing we can do is give someone the impression that they are in when they are not. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 25 verse 31. When the Son of Man recomes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Christ said, at the end of all days, God will make the distinction. God will make clear who is in and who is out. And only those who put their faith in Jesus are in. Not everyone will be in. Only those who put their faith in Jesus will be in. And therefore, the most unloving thing we can do is to say that everyone is in, is to say that everyone is saved, when it's not true. 
We need to be clear here. Only, ultimately, only God knows who is saved. We do not know who is saved, but we are to be clear with one another what God has revealed to us. Salvation is by faith alone. Only those who have put faith in God will be saved. But that's not all the Bible says. The Bible says it's not enough to just say you have faith, although that is important. Saving faith will be evidenced in the fruit of our lives. Jesus puts it this way, Matthew 7 verse 15. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will, be re you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Saving faith will be evidenced in the fruit of our lives. Which means that if someone is not living a life that shows the fruit of following Jesus, the most loving thing we can do is not to say nothing, it's to say something. We say it with love, and with gentleness, and with respect, and with the wisdom and timing that God gives us. But the most loving thing we can do is not to say nothing, it's to say something especially if everyone else is keeping silent. We make the distinction, but we make the distinction not to push people away, but to invite people in. Let me tie this with a couple of things we do at Christ City. Every week, before we celebrate communion, we make clear that communion is only for those who follow Jesus. Because communion unites us who follow Jesus to Christ and to each other. And we, we, we make clear that there's a distinction because if you don't follow Jesus, we don't want you to be saying something about yourself that is not true. We don't say it to push people away. We say it to invite people in. Matthew 5 and 1 Corinthians 11, they also give instructions on situations when people should not take communion, even if they are followers of Jesus, because of a serious sin or conflict that is happening, that is impacting others. So we, so we see this distinction in the way we do communion, but the other thing I want to talk about is, is about becoming a covenant member of a local church. A local church is not a service we attend. It's not a building we enter. It's a body of believers who represent Jesus and gather every Sunday to worship Jesus. That, that's why the distinction is so important. The local church is, is, is a body of believers who represent Jesus. and The distinction is important in a city where many people are confused about who Jesus is and what Jesus does. Often they look to the local church to represent Jesus. And that's why there needs to be a distinction. For a local church to represent Jesus, there needs to be a distinction between those who are in and those who are out. Between those who have committed to representing Jesus in that local church and those who have not. Covenant membership is part of making that distinction. Covenant membership is not like Costco membership. No, it's, it's actually completely different. Covenant membership is commitment. Committing to the local church and having that local church commit to you and affirm the fruits of faith they see in you. When you, when you become a covenant member, your, your church is saying, this person can represent Jesus. We're looking out for her. And they are committed to us. And so for those of you who are not members of a local church, this is my call for you to commit to becoming a covenant member of a local church. Now, I'm not saying you have to become members of Christ City Church. 
I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying you should move towards becoming members of a local church. At Christ City, to become a covenant member means a 90-minute class about what the church is and who the church is, and then sitting down with an elder to talk about your journey to faith and how the church can be walking alongside you in your journey of faith. We, we have a covenant, we have, because I know some of you are asking me this later, we have membership classes at Christ City a few times a year, and if you're interested, you can keep an ear out for our next one, or you can reach out to me uh, if you want to move towards membership. So details, distinction, and lastly, discipleship. Remembering comes hand in hand with discipleship. We see it in the instructions for the Passover. Look at 12.24. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as He has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For He passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. We see this, we also see this in the instructions for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 13 verse 8. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. I love how this language suddenly becomes so personal. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Christ City, in, in these two passages, notice how remembering and discipleship, they come hand in hand. You can't remember what God has done for you without telling others what God has done for you. But we need to be clear, discipleship is not just within physical families, it's within spiritual families. No one is exempt. Everyone is to pass on the story of God's salvation to the next generation. If you know what God has done for you, you're qualified to tell others what God has done for you. There's no special training involved. There just has to be an understanding of what God has done for you and remembering what God has done for you by telling others what God has done for you. And I love how it is assumed that the kids are involved. The kids aren't just put to one side while all this happens. No, the kids are involved in the remembering. They were right there. So again, practically, what does this look like for our church? Practically, for parents and grandparents and uncles and aunties, we need to make sure we, we, are, we don't outsource discipleship of kids to the professionals. God doesn't say, give them to someone else. No, God says, when, when the child asks you, you say, this is what God has done for me. Christ City, do we have a regular rhythm of telling the next generation about God's salvation? Do we live in such a way that the children will ask us, why do you do that? Why do you live that way? But this is also an encouragement to disciple the next generation by serving in kids and youth ministry. The kids and youth ministries always have space for more leaders, but in particular, David has, has shared with me that there are a couple of youth leaders away for the next couple of months, and so there's a particular opportunity for more leaders in the youth ministry for this next couple of months in particular. All this to say, if some of you ask for a very specific practical application, this is it. <laughs> is God asking you to disciple our youth? There's no particular age. There's no particular profile. There's no even a particular training needed to be a youth leader. And if you want to find out more, Dave would love to chat with you. Our time is coming to an end, so let me end with this. Christ City, God has saved us from death and He has freed us from slavery. There is always much to do. There's always much to do. But the to-do list will never finish. There's always much to do. Let's, so, so let's make sure that in all that we do, 
we understand and remember who God is and who He has saved us to be. And if you're able, could you please stand as we respond to God's Word together?